Hi, I'm Ashley Ford, and this is 112BK. Coming up, Prospect Park's gardeners have mobilized thousands of ladybugs into its aster fields. Their mission? Stop the carnage. The asters were looking pretty bad. It was spreading quickly. We were finding lace bugs on asters all over, um, just all over where we were working. So realizing that it was spreading a lot more quickly than we thought. And then a Brooklyn doctor very much at home in his lane, talking about gun violence and public health, gives us his take on the latest gun-related news. Many doctors, no matter how they feel about politics or gun rights, mm -hmm. are at the front lines of treating uh, gun trauma, right? right? And so the, the, the responses have been really, really remarkable. And I, and I think it's really hopefully, hopefully a turning point in the relationship between the medical community and really what is a public health emergency. This just in, an elite crew of 72,000 ladybugs has been deployed to Prospect Park to save its ubiquitous and beloved asters, the flower, not the family, from a gang of murderous and marauding lace bugs. Quick, call Pixar, I've got a movie for you. But seriously, these flowers are on the brink and the park officials have called in the arthropodic equivalent of a SWAT team. To tell us more, we're joined on the phone by the assistant gardener of the Prospect Park Alliance, Allie Liu. Thanks for joining us at this tense time, Allie. Yeah, thanks for having me. Can you tell me what's going on over there? Why do you need so many ladybugs? So, yeah, of course. So um, this actually was over the summer in July. We were noticing that... Um, uh, many of the leaves, many aster plants, uh, which were not yet flowering, were dying. They were turning brown and, and dying way prematurely before even flowering. And um, so when we looked into it, we found these little bugs on them called lace bugs. And these bugs um, are, you know, they'll, they'll eat the plants. And if, if they eat the plants, they won't come back the next year, but they will... Um, prevent those the asters from flowering that year so they were they were rapidly spreading and essentially they would have decimated the population of asters which is um, a native flower and one of our main uh, one of our main plants all throughout the park and especially at lakeside where I'm uh, where I'm gardening so we looked into different methods of trying to get rid of these lace bugs and um, and decided on doing an innovative management approach, which is um, IPM using natural predators, um, ladybugs. We tried some other stuff first, like using neem oil and different things, which I can talk about if you want. Um, but yeah, we... Yeah. I mean, well, whose idea was it specific to deploy the ladybugs? Like, they're a really special insect, right? Yeah, ladybugs are ladybugs are awesome. They're... they're um, a main uh, a main IPM um, method, and also just great bugs in general um, for themselves. But um, they, uh, we also decided together. We were looking into how different ways of getting rid of lace bugs, yeah. and that is one approach that's commonly used, especially in farming. Um, and so, along with um, my my other lead gardener L J Philp and uh, my other assistant gardener who, uh, Ariel Walker, we we all just kind of thought about it, decided this might be a good way, and we're looking into pricing. Um, and it was actually also the cheapest option. We thought wow. it was a really cool way to do something, um, you know, ecologically friendly um, and test this out as a way of, of bringing um, a, na a natural way of getting these plants back on their, on their so feet. That's so cool. I, I love the idea that this is even something you can do. But I also, I'm going to be honest, am completely confused because, like, where do you even get 72,000 ladybugs? That is a really good question. Um, yeah, it's it's strange. You can just buy them online. What? Um, Wait. Looked up. It's. You can just buy them online? <laughs> yeah. So so what we did, we bought, um, we looked online. There are a bunch of different um, options, and I can't remember exactly which gardening store we 
ended up going with, but we got them online. Uh, the whole 72,000 came together in kind of like a canvas bag almost, and they were refrigerated. So they're kind of dormant when they're refrigerated. They had some little um, kind of like hemp-type material that kind of kept them, yeah, they're just dormant. And then once you take them out um, and they thaw out, then they, like, revive themselves. It's kind of crazy. It's wild. Okay, so I, we only have um, about half a minute left. So what's the status report from the front lines? How are the Asters doing this year? Um, there, so we did this in June, and mm-hmm. it was the asters were looking pretty bad. It was spreading quickly. We were finding lace bugs on asters all over, um, just all over where we were working. Mm-hmm. So realizing that it was spreading a lot more quickly than we thought. Um, but since the, since since putting the ladybugs, we did that in July, and then in you know after a couple of months, we really haven't seen any lace bugs at all. Um, so I think they they went to work really fast, ate all the bugs, and and the asters, many of the asters, um, just bloomed or are still in bloom right now, and they look beautiful. Go ladybugs, and go you for taking care of the asters, so the rest of Brooklyn people like me can enjoy them. I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thanks so much. It's been a little over a week since the latest large-scale mass shooting in America, at least at the time of taping, the one in Thousand Oaks, California. It's been just about the same amount of time since the National Rifle Association told, quote, self-important anti-gun doctors to stay in their lane after a doctor's group called gun violence a public health crisis. It has been about five days since some of those self-important doctors emphatically said, no, this is our lane. You can check out that hashtag. And it's been almost a week since the bit of news, a self-proclaimed neo-Nazi was arrested in D.C. He'd been making threatening posts on social media and professed a devotion to Charleston church shooter Dylan Roof, as well as support for the recent pipe bombing suspect, whose actions he called a dry run for things to come. But what got him arrested? Two family members called the FBI and he was picked up on gun charges. This cocktail of gun stories inspired us to bring back our frequent contributor, Jonathan Mutzel, a Vanderbilt University professor who works at the intersections of guns, medicine, and mental health. Welcome back to 112BK. Thanks so much. It's great to be back. So much is always happening. All the time. I want to start with the latest news first. A neo-Nazi active on social media obviously made these threats against journalists, against Jewish people, um, expressing support of all kinds of racism. He was arrested on gun charges because his family members notified the FBI that they were concerned. Um, How significant is that? Well, I think it's significant in, in, for a, n- a number of reasons. One is it's, it's important just to say up front that not everybody who makes uh, char- you know threats or charges like that on social media is a threat to go out and do that. And right. So the hard part is how do you know among the thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of people who are out there saying crazy stuff on the Internet or on chats or websites or things like that, how do you know – who is actually a threat to public health, uh, their right. own their own health, their family, the community. Um, what I think is important about what happened in D.C. is several fold. First is that it shows the importance of families and social networks mm-hmm. in identifying relatives who are escalating and at threat of violence. There's a uh, there's a, um, an issue here uh, called a gun violence restraining order that is something that the gun violence prevention crowd really pushes. And the, uh, the basic idea of, of that is that it's not always going to be the police or a psychiatrist or some authority figure who can see if someone who's at threat of violence is going to be escalating. But the mm-hmm. relatives very often know, you know, Uncle Charlie is really crazy today, but wow, he's really, really, really crazy t- uh, tomorrow right. or something like that. And so I think that in a way what it does is it empowers families to identify uh, people who can come help. And what happens then is that uh, guns are taken away for a, a limited period of time, usually about right. about 30, years, uh, 30 days. excuse me. And so I think the first issue is just that this case emphasizes the importance of families and social networks mm-hmm. in identifying who is at risk of violence, particularly when there are so many people making threats and honestly, so many so many guns out there. Right. The other ironic part is that this happened in D.C., and D.C. has some very strict gun laws. Mm-hmm. Um, D.C. famously uh, regulates um, assault, assault weapons, assault rifles. 
And the reason that's important is because there was a, a, a really high profile case in a lower court uh, several years ago in which the court ruled that DC had the right to enact its strict gun laws because it knew its local population. But there right. was a dissenting voice, a very radical right dissenting voice in that case, who said that the Second Amendment basically trumps everything. The argument basically was gun rights are like free speech. We can't regulate them in this country. Mm. And this justice said, DC has no right to regulate its own gun laws. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on what side you're on, that justice was Brett Kavanaugh, who is now sitting on the Supreme Court. And so the idea of DC gun laws happening, um, hap you know, the effectiveness of DC gun laws is something that I, I mean, for people who want to see this, I urge people to go back and read that opinion because it really is a very far radical right opinion. I mean, it sounds pretty far radical, right? This one's on the record. I mean, the, uh, the yes. basically his argument was that, that, that the courts are not are not the arbiters of public health, um, mm. and that in, in a way, um, the Second Amendment, because it's a historical document, it supersedes other 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 rights, like a city's right to um, a city's right to set its own gun laws based on what it what what, what works, and so okay. it's it's really quite. Uh, scary. Yeah, that's quite scary. Um, in other news, the NRA told doctors to stay in their lanes, which is so interesting to me. I never would have thought a million years to tell a doctor you don't get to say <laughs> that this is a public health issue, but whatever. Um, there was some powerful and passionate responses from doctors. I saw some that literally, I mean, they just took my breath away. Um, I'm wondering, what's your take on this situation at all? Well, first of all, I'm really proud of doctors. Doctors mm -hmm. generally tend to be rather apolitical. And right. of course, it's important to remember that there are a range of political opinions in the medical community. There are many pro-gun doctors, many mm -hmm. anti-gun doctors, many people who just don't want to be involved. They feel like the doctor-patient interaction is the most important thing. I think this was an important turning moment because the NRA really has had its way with doctors in a certain kind of way over the over the past years. I mean, this probably started back in the mid 1990s mm -hmm. when there were a series of articles in leading medical journals that basically made this radical argument that having a gun in your home increases the chance of having a shooting in your home, either an accidental shooting, a homicide, or a suicide. Now, that seems kind of self-evident, right? I mean, right. it'd be hard to have a shooting if there was no gun in your house. Right. Um, and I don't think the authors of those studies, two major studies, thought that they were going to enter this firestorm. But what happened was the NRA and its political supporters used these studies to enact a ban on federally funded gun research that's been in place for almost three decades now. In other words, basically they said, because you're making this argument, the same argument that people are making now, mm -hmm. um, you don't have the right to actually get funding to do your research. And so that was the first part of the story. The second part of the story is that there have been gag laws in certain states like Florida that tell doctors you can't ask your patients about whether they have guns in their home. It kind of follows on that first argument. So this right. idea that the NRA can dictate doctor-patient interactions. And I honestly think this was just something that's been building up for quite a long time. And yeah. whether intentional or not, this tweet really set off a lot of frustration um, in the medical community, both because of this history of being told what to do, what to research, but also because many doctors, no matter how they feel about politics or gun rights, mm -hmm. are at the front lines of treating uh, gun trauma, right? right? And so the the, uh, the responses have been really, really remarkable, and I, and I think it's really hopefully, hopefully a turning point in the relationship between the medical community and really what is a public health emergency. So number one is that there's a shifting political agenda right now that the NRA isn't doesn't at least for the midterms didn't have the hold on the election that it that it did before. The second mm -hmm. is that there were some very important studies. A CDC report came out looking at trends in gun death and gun injury, uh, you know, uh, over 2015, 2016, mm -hmm. and it turned out that even though rates of death for many other man-made pathogens have been going down, like car accidents and secondhand smoke and things like that, um, I'm guessing that it's not the same for it's guns. It's not the same for guns. That all yeah. of a sudden we saw a pretty statistically significant rise in gun death in this 2015-2016 um, data set. And so that was a, that's a huge thing. Often in, in kind of so-called first world Western countries, mm -hmm. we don't see increasing rates of death. And so number two was that there was this huge report from the CDC that came out mm -hmm. um, that talked about more death. And then the third was the American College of Physicians put out a report basically saying, we're not going to stand for this anymore. And they called gun violence and gun death 
um, an injury, a public health emergency, and really laid out what they thought needed to happen, something that on one hand respected people's Second Amendment rights, mm -hmm. but on the other hand was quite, I think, quite forward thinking about here are the laws we would like to see passed. And right. so there were all these forces against it. And I always, you know, it's kind of the traditional strategy. If you can change the channel into something that is a distraction, that gets people really charged. So I did think when I saw this that there's all this really important medical stuff happening. Mm -hmm. But who, I mean, who knows what's going yeah. on? But it you maybe. You never really know. Yeah. But, eh. <laughs> <laughs> Walks like a duck, talks like a duck. It's hard not to call it a duck. And there we have a lot of ducks. We know. have a lot of ducks. <laughs> um, so one of the sources of the NRA's ire was that position paper um, is the American Collective of Physician, Physicians. I was wondering, can you talk to me a little bit more about what was in that paper? Sure. What kind of laws do they want to see supported? Because I think there are, I think most people both feel like feel like there is a way to respect the Second Amendment right and make us safer from gun violence. And I think that was exactly the, what the what the what the um, American College of Physicians right. was doing was it was basically saying there has to be a middle ground in this country mm -hmm. where we respect people's Second Amendment rights, but we don't go off the deep end in terms of having no policies anywhere. And so it right. actually was pretty straightforward basic stuff. Let's expand the background check system mm -hmm. uh, into a national model, which has seen to be effective. Doctors shouldn't be gagged about what they can ask their patients about. There are important factors about certain gun laws, like laws that might um, make it harder to get a semi-automatic rifle or an assault rifle. Right. Um, so they were actually relatively traditional things in terms of um, you know, what was being proposed. It was kind of like, we right. want to respect people's rights, but let's also find a way to identify high-risk people, and also let's do something to curb everyday gun violence. And so right. it was it was kind of a lot of point-of-sale things and things like that. But the interesting point is that— It sounds so reasonable. It's, Sorry. <laughs> you know, it's unbelievably reasonable. And the, the other point is that, uh, the uh, you know, the American medical establishment was relatively quiet on this issue for about right. two decades. And so the yeah. fact that even even this happened, I think, is, is pretty remarkable. But, again, I would urge people who are interested to read this paper. It's very— point by point, nine points, mm -hmm. very straightforward stuff. And I think, again, it's trying to find a reasonable middle ground that might be a, a, some kind of platform for future action. Well, there was a Times Magazine cover story this last weekend that talked about how U.S. law enforcement had failed to see the threat of white nationalism. And that seems evident. I feel like nobody should really be arguing <laughs> against that because it's it's evident. It's in the news all the time and now they don't know how to stop it. So it says a virulent movement has grown and, mast and metastasized. Uh, you've just written a book called Dying of Whiteness, which come on, let's talk about that sometime. <laughs> Please. Um, and it reminds us of the thesis. Can you talk a little bit about those connections? Sure. So I should say, just to clarify, the book comes out the first week of March. Um, and so it's, you know, on Amazon now, but the actual copies will go out later. But No, those pre-orders are important. Please. They better get on this. Uh, get, you know, yeah. <laughs> get <laughs> any, on this. Any help you want to give me, that's great. Yes. But, um, but anyway, it'll be, it'll be coming out the first the first week of March. Um, mm -hmm. And so much more about that to come. But I will say that there are, there are several strains that are happening in this country right now. First, of course, we've become more aware of you know, white ethno-nationalism in mm -hmm. this country. And that's something that certainly has been furthered by certain agendas at the presidential level, by people at, you know, at, the, at the presidential level, um, and in, in ways that are not unbelievably subtle. Mm -hmm. And then we see them highlighted in times like the, the, the mass shooting in the, in the synagogue in Pittsburgh, for example, right. and this case in DC and things like that. So it right. does feel like there's a movement that has become more vocal, more, uh, more, um, more active, and potentially more violent in, in mm -hmm. this moment because they feel empowered. And I, I think that's really the, the you know, cause Causality is a very hard argument for um, right. somebody who does what I do to make as a social scientist. But I will say that there are a number of high-profile shootings where, and the pipe bomber, for example, the same yes. kind of thing, where it did seem like there was some kind of push by the um, the message mm -hmm. that this kind of agenda is okay. And so certainly I think that that's something that we were just too slow to pick up on because it felt very fringe. Right. And all of a sudden, it, ent it entered the mainstream. And I think that's an ongoing story that we're going to have to pay attention to. The other part is what I write about in the book, which mm -hmm. is that 
it's not just about extremism. There also have been state-level policies and agendas that have in enacted, for example, anti-immigrant platforms in mm -hmm. many states, pro-gun agendas in many states, um, budget cuts that impact minority and low-income communities in many states. And so really in the book, I look at what happens to public health in a community when your state apparatus is taken over by agendas that cut taxes. Uh, yes. and, and really what I show is the irony is it's very, very bad for minority populations, but it turns out the health of white Americans suffers, uh, d you know, really almost disproportionately in many right. cases as well, because just to be blunt about it, there are many more white people in the area mm -hmm. where these policies are getting enacted. So I feel like we're having a national conversation right now about whiteness, which has been maybe going beneath the radar for a long time, but mm -hmm. it, nothing's under the radar, you know, with no. Trump and things like that. So. No, it can't be. Yeah. <laughs> it can't be under the radar because they go put it on the table. It's on the table. And you're going to have to talk about it. Please. Um, so this is something interesting because um, right here in the neighborhood not too long ago, a woman was attacked at a train station, um, but she was attacked with a knife. Um, a they said a, a white man around five foot two attacked her with a knife, called her a black bitch, and stabbed her, um, and they hit her multiple times. And part of me just keeps thinking, would people be paying more attention to it if she had been shot instead of stabbed? <laughs> and also, it made me think about um, Brooklyn as a whole and our borough president, Eric Adams, who came and spoke to the neighborhood from that train station about what had happened. Uh, but <laughs> after the Pittsburgh shooting, uh, the borough president urged all off-duty law enforcement to bring their guns into places of worship. And I heard that, and I thought, I don't know how that's going to work, Eric Adams. I mean, what are your thoughts on something like that happening? Well, I can understand the impetus, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I think that there's something powerful about a community rallying against, against a hate crime that I think is very important. And I also think that, in general, New York is a success story about why... Um, why gun laws matter, right? New York is a very, very dense, uh, diverse population area, mm -hmm. and the amount of gun crime we have relative to our population, I think, is relatively, um, you know, not actually, actually, a testament to the success of laws like the SAFE Act that was passed right. in New York and also the strength of neighboring states. Um, so unlike Chicago, it's very hard to just drive to Connecticut and get a gun. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, overall, overall, as horrible as that attack was, the fact that it happened with a knife and not a semi-automatic rifle um, right. is in, in some ways a testament to the success of, of this. And I, I can't say that enough in part because just to get back to the Supreme Court for a second, um, you know, it's important because there are uh, movements, uh, what's called concealed carry reciprocity, a, mm -hmm. a move to undermine every state's ability to set its own gun laws. And so I think that's going to be an important point is why don't we hold up the success of New York right. um, rather than uh, try to bring more guns into New York. Now, that being said, I have to be honest, I do worry about responding to particular anecdotal crimes, even mass shootings, by saying we need more guns in those areas. And part of why that is is look at all the places we've had mass shootings. I mean, movie theaters, um, churches, synagogues, schools, schools country music concerts. And mm -hmm. in a way, it, 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 what happens is we start to you know, militarize really everyday spaces. Yeah. And so it's a tension between everyday security, but I think the data really shows that when you get away from you know, high profile crimes, that having more guns in an area increases the chance of other kinds of shootings like oh, accidental yeah. shootings or partner violence or things right. like that. And so we can't really, I just, I worry that we're just gonna put a gun in every single spa safe space. Right, plus the good guy with the gun thing doesn't always work as we just saw the young man who was a security officer um, apprehended, yeah. <laughs> you know, someone who was actually trying to rob the place. The police showed up, saw him with the gun and shot him and killed him on sight. Um, so it's just another one of those things. It's like this can, this can also go very wrong. I think there are two take on points, yeah. One is that, you know, Gun violence doesn't happen in a vacuum. It intersects with race and class mm -hmm. and other political tensions. We need to talk about all those things. Mm -hmm. And the second is really that as hard as it seems in moments of trauma like this, mm -hmm. we need to work to, to stem the tide of everyday gun violence. Right. That will make us safer as a society. Jonathan, thank you so much for this conversation. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. Who killed the electric car? That's an easy one. 
the fossil fuel lobby. But what happens now that the electric car is back and here to stay? That one's a little more interesting, which is why the future of electric vehicles, EVs, is today's issue on the table. Jeremy McCool, a Brooklyn entrepreneur with an awesome name, believes he has the solution, and it's called Hevo Power. Based in Red Hook, Hevo Power is a startup tech endeavor with the task of outfitting electric cars with wireless charging stations. Here's how it works. An EV parks on top of a power station, a surface embedded in the ground that transmits electricity via radio waves to a receiver on the underside of the vehicle. But like mice and cookies, once you give drivers wireless chargers, they're going to want a road trip. Which is why widespread EV adoption can enable a system called vehicle to grid. Electric vehicles communicate with the power grid to either supply or siphon energy based on need, stabilizing energy costs and flow. By 2023, McCool hopes to implement dynamic charging, outfitting roads with power strips that charge vehicles as they drive over them. The big idea is that if we make charging electric vehicles easy and even seamless, more people would be willing to dump their gas guzzlers. If that's not enough Jetsons talk for you, Hevo is also working with a flying EV company to create launch pads that can wirelessly charge aircraft between takeoff and landing. That's right. Looks like McCool should change his name to McFly, because where he's going, they don't need roads. And that's the show for today. Next week, sadly, will be my last week on 112BK. I'm going to miss you guys, but it'll be a bang-up couple of episodes. We've got Rebecca Traster talking about her new book on the power of women's anger, and The Innocence Project will discuss prosecutors and the overuse of plea bargains. Hope to see you then.